Welcome to the uh, 23rd Annual Joseph and Michelle Medical House Staff Award Lecture. Dr. Joseph Michelle was a resident in the internal medicine training program here at Columbia when he was diagnosed with advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer during his PGY2 year. He never smoked, so this was especially shocking to everyone. I had the privilege of serving as his oncologist. Ken Prager, who could not be here today, was his pulmonologist, and uh, John Bilizikian, um was his mentor during the um, endocrine fellowship, which he was able to start. He, um, Joseph battled the disease for four years before finally succumbing to it. He was an excellent physician who was compassionate and caring, placing the welfare of his patients above all other concerns. He had a wonderful sense of humor and a deep interest in medical ethics, particularly Jewish medical ethics. He lived by these ethics and implemented them in his daily encounters with patients and colleagues. Joseph's family felt that the most appropriate way they could honor and preserve his memory was to create a house staff award in his name and sponsor a speaker who would discuss a topic concerning medical ethics at this annual presentation ceremony. The program today consists of three parts. First, comments by a member of the Michelle family, followed by the invited speaker, and then the award ceremony. So now I would like to invite uh, Jeremy Michelle, one of Joseph's nephews, to the podium. Good afternoon. As Dr. Stupler mentioned, my name is Jeremy Michelle. I am Joseph's nephew, and I am honored to speak on behalf of the family. This year marks the 23rd year that Joseph and Michelle House Staff Award has been sponsored by our family. This year also marks a first for our family in that for the first time, I, the family representative, like many of you, never met Joseph. I was born just months after Joe passing, and I carry his name. I am Jeremy Joseph Michelle. And though I did not know Joseph, I grew up in a home where his life and his values were frequent topic of conversation. So much so that despite having never met him, those values are very much alive for me. Our family provides this award on an our family provides this award on an annual basis as a way of memorializing Joseph and perpetuating the values by which he lived and practiced medicine. Joseph was known as a house officer who always tried to internalize the totality of his patients' situation as he attempted to help them medically. His approach to medicine was a synthesis of competent medical care, advocacy for his patient, compassion and kindness. It was not unusual for Joseph to call a clinic patient who, knew, who he knew lived at home alone on a Friday afternoon to make sure that his, his patient had picked up his prescription and that he had food in the refrigerator. There, these were my uncle's proudest moments as a physician. During the course of his illness, Joe had the fortune of being treated and cared for by astounding physicians in his institution who cared for him precisely the way he would have sought to treat others. I speak, of course, among others, Dr. Ken Prager and Mark Stupler. We are delighted that Dr. Stupler is here today, and we miss Dr. Prager, who, to his credit, has not missed but this singles year event in the 23 years we have been doing this. It is only fitting that Dr. Prager conflict requiring him to Requiring to be overseas involves a medical ethics issue that would have been close to Joseph's heart. We as a family have eternal great gratitude towards Dr. Prager and Stupler and everybody that com comprised and comprises the in this institution and are honored to be here today with the Department of Medicine as you bestow the 23rd year annual Joseph Michelle House Staff Award to a worthy medical house officer chosen by his or her peers. And we are honored to hear from you hear from your invited guest lecturer, Dr. Mildred Solomon, president of the highly respected Hastings Center, who joins us and the long list of distinguished lecturers who have graced us in the past. It is a great honor for me to extend these introductory remarks on behalf of the family. Thank you all and congratulations to the awardee. Our speaker today, as you heard, is Dr. Mildred Solomon, president of the Hastings Center, one of the nation's premier bioethics institutes. She has an international reputation for her research on and advocacy for wiser healthcare and science policy. 
She is Professor of Anesthesia part-time at Harvard Medical School, where she directs the school's fellowship in bioethics. The focus of her bioethics scholarship has been on the ethics of end-of-life care for adults and children, organ transplantation, protection of human research participants, responsible conduct of research, and governance of the emerging technologies. She has served on committees of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. The title of Dr. Solomon's talk is Enhancing End-of-Life Care, Progress, Obstacles, and New Directions. Okay, great. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. I want to thank Dr. Prager and Dr. Stupler and Dr. Landry for inviting me. And most especially, I want to thank the Michelle family for creating this opportunity and this focus on ethics that's been a longstanding focus um, supported by the family for, for a long time. It's a, it's a real blessing that you've contributed to the organization, and I'm honored to participate in it. I can't resist by... Um, saying a little bit about the Hastings Center. We are located just, oops, I should tell you I have nothing to disclose, um, <clears throat> other than what I will be stating explicitly over the next 40 minutes. Um, we're located about an hour and 10 minutes um, north of Manhattan in the beautiful Hudson River Valley. It's one of the most beautiful train rides you can imagine, and I want you to know that we have an open door policy, and here's the view if you come to, to visit us from our, from our main entrance. Um, and we do have a visiting scholar program that brings visitors from all over the world, and you can, we, I want to encourage you if, you, if you care about the kinds of issues that we're going to be talking about, to come and consider um, applying to our visiting scholar program. So here's what I want us to grapple with together on this, on this beautiful May morning. Isaac Asimov actually put it very succinctly. Life is pleasant. Death is peaceful. It's the transition that's troublesome. I'd like to tell you about a troubling transition. Brian was an earnest young man who pretty much accosted me at the end of one of my talks. He rushed up to me at the lectern, and he grabbed my arm, and he said, you mean they didn't have to do that to her? He was talking about his very beloved grandmother. She had suffered a stroke, she had some cognitive deficits and some physical impairment, but she could still signal pleasure and displeasure, and she could sometimes speak in short phrases. For quite a while, his grandmother recognized Brian and his parents and seemed to appreciate their visits to her where, where she was in the nursing home. But then she suffered a second stroke and was left without the ability to speak or swallow, and a feeding tube was placed. Ultimately, Brian told me a tale of decreasing capacity and increasing dementia, fear, and unhappiness. She got pneumonia several times, and each time she was sent to the hospital for intravenous antibiotics, and each time her dementia worsened, and she returned to the nursing home more frightened and more disoriented. As the weeks went by, Brian's parents and Brian began to feel that, um, that enough was enough. And, and the grandmother, when she, they would show up for visits, would just do this, which they interpreted as to say, I don't want to go back to the hospital. I understand that I don't want anything but comfort. So his parents um, and he spoke with the nursing home and asked that she receive comfort measures only and that she be allowed to succumb to the pneumonia the next time she got it. The nursing home administrators were appalled and refused the family's request. Then matters grew even more dire in Brian's view. His grandmother's kidneys failed, and the nursing home referred her for dialysis, despite the fact that she was unconscious most of the time. Brian and his parents became enraged, and they began to look for legal options. The transition that Brian's grandmother faced represents a relatively new problem. If we look at this in the span of history, this is really quite a new problem. There was a time roughly in the mid-20th century when death was out of our hands. 
in the United States and other developed countries, people died primarily as recently as 40 or 50 years ago from infectious diseases and unexpected injuries. And then, of course, we had greatly enhanced public health, sanitation, the emergence of antibiotics, and life-sustaining tools like ventilators and dialysis machines, so that most of us in wealthy nations now live much longer than ever, but with long periods of chronic and progressive conditions. So what's that, what's that meant is what you live every single day, that quite suddenly the timing and the circumstances of death are for the first time in human history largely in human hands. So now it is we mere mortals, and especially clinicians, um, who, working with families who must decide when a medical or surgical intervention is likely to be beneficial or add misery. Uh, and we just haven't known how to grapple with this. You know, uh, it's not surprising that we first turned to um, thinking about this as a problem of rights. Um, and I think that, you know, this is Karen Ann Quinlan, Quinlan on the cover of Newsweek in 1976. Her father asked the um, court whether her ventilator could be withdrawn or not. Um, and that's because her doctors really wanted the family to go to court to find out. The doctors were concerned that this might be considered a murder. And it was that uncertainty, the very newness of the question, which is what caused her to be put on the cover of Newsweek. Um, in the 10 to 15 years after Quinlan, there were roughly 200 similar court cases, and they were all of this shape, with families urging clinicians to cease and desist. And the courts have ruled similarly in all those cases, that patients have the right to forego any kind of treatment at all, no matter how complex or how simple, and if they have lost capacity to make those decisions themselves, their families and others who have known, or, or those who have known them best um, can speak on their behalf. And the central guiding principle that we arrived at was based on our notions of liberty and of rights, basically focused on patient self-determination. And this wasn't just a growing legal consideration over the first 20 years of this debate. It was also supported by an ethics consensus. Um, this is the, one of the first reports in the country that came out of the President's Commission for the Study of Bioethical Problems, which was convened by Ronald Reagan. And then at about the same time, this um, was a report that came out from the Hastings Center. And they, um, they both affirmed, they were very, very aligned in their findings, they both affirmed the, uh, an individual's right to self-determination. Um, and that's why we've put so much emphasis on advanced directives, and more recently we've talked about not advanced directives, but also advanced care planning. It's based on a commitment to autonomy, to, which I'm using almost interchangeably with the concept of patient self-determination. It's based on our American focus on liberty, on individualism, and on rights. But what I want to talk about today, that's the history that brings us to today. I want to talk about at least three problems that are, are related to our focus on autonomy. And let me just foreshadow the three, and then I'm going to give you examples of each, of each one. We haven't yet actually achieved the promise of autonomy because we don't actually have real patient self-determination, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. So here we have organized our whole bioethics framework and our clinical care and our orientation to clinical ethics about the rights of individuals to be self-determining, and I think it is a promise that we, have, we are far from reaching. Secondly, this is may be ironic, not only have we not reached the promise, but we've also, in a way, overlearned the principle. I might say bioethics has overtaught the, the principle of autonomy, and we're over-applying it. So we, we're coming up short on our own aspirations for autonomy, but we're also misapplying it and over, overreaching with it. So I'm going to give you an example of that. And then finally, this could have just as easily been the topic, the title of my talk. From, I think we have to move from securing rights, which are very important and we want to maintain, to meeting patients' and families' needs. A focus on rights can only take us so far. We need to address needs. So let me take up the first issue first. We haven't yet, you know, we haven't yet met autonomy's promise, is another way of saying this. 
Despite our emphasis on autonomy and advanced care planning, the goal of ensuring authentic patient self-determination and real shared decision-making hasn't been achieved, not by a long shot. Um, Sharon Kaufman is a, a very, very, um, uh, a wonderful anthropologist who's really studied healthcare in the United States. She wrote a book in 2006 specifically on end of life care, and then another one in 2015 on the U.S. healthcare system more, ge more generally. And her results are very important for all of us to pay attention to. She's described how patients and families, and very often doctors too, actually do not decide. Um, about treatment so much as they yield to procedures. That's what I want us to focus on for just a few minutes, how so much of what we think looks like decision making really is just a, a, an entrenched pathway, a default that patients and families are moved along. Um, many of these interventions that patients yield to, and they sometimes demand, are not evidence-based, they don't meet patients' needs, and they introduce harms. And these harms represent ethical gaps in our commitments to do no harm, to relieve suffering, and to promote well-being. For example, I will pick on um, nephrology, with all apologies to Dr. Landry. Um, dialysis is frequently offered to patients in a way that they don't understand so it's fair to say that while patients may yield or exceed to the recommendation for dialysis, they are not actually giving truly informed consent. There's now a large growing literature on this. Here, for example, is a piece by um, Alvin Moss, Woody Moss, for those of you who know him, and Rebecca Schmidt. Um, they found that many patients didn't realize that they had a choice. 61% reported regret <coughs> at having started dialysis, and 85% said it was extremely or at least somewhat important to be informed about the option to withdraw. In this article, um, Woody and Rebecca offer suggestions for recognizing when the burdens of dialysis may outweigh its benefits and how to broach a truly informed consent, a truly informed conversation with patients and families. So in the case of dialysis, you could say that it's not so much that patients are making a decision so much as that they are simply going with the flow. And the leadership in nephrology has actually recognized this, and they've developed guidelines to encourage um, a more robust conversation about choices. But um, their own sense from the Society of Nephrology is that these guidelines have not yet been taken up. They were issued in 2010. And that's not surprising, because we know that guidelines alone do not make cha behavior change. Now, dialysis is but one example of, a deeply, of deeply habituated patterns of care that for large numbers of people offer very little benefit or questionable benefit about which there should be a conscious decision. Some families will opt for and some will opt not to, but the conversation has to occur and too often it doesn't because it's just a default. We're passing through a protocol. I'll give you a couple of more examples. It's frequently the case that extended rounds of chemotherapy result in tumor shrinkage but don't extend survival. And yet too often the difference between tumor shrinkage and survival is not overtly discussed. Another example is the reality that nearly one third of all Medicare patients have a stay in an ICU in the last month of life. Many of these people also endure multiple transitions of care settings. They move, Giontino calls it churning them. They churn from home to hospital to nursing home and rehab facility very in the, in the last few days and weeks of life. Research, some research shows that for many people there have been as many as three different care settings in the last 30 days before death. Now one of the things driving these patterns of care is the, over, is the, is the, is the, is the wonderfulness of specialized health care. But the downside of that is that patients are treated by so many specialists who are experts in specific organ systems, but there's, no, but there's sort of no quarterback trying to organize what is going to be best given the goals of, for this patient. Um, there are some remedies. So now CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, is allowing physicians to charge, and I hope everyone here is doing this. <laughs> They're allowing you to charge for advanced care planning conversations. And there's no limit to how many you can charge for. 
um, because it's a recognition that people's circumstances change and it's important to stay in dialogue. Um, so the, um, there's also a growing number of family consults that do try to provide the, the, the role of quarterback. Um, there's a lot of research that these meetings actually make a huge difference in the ways in which people decide to um, shape the care of their loved ones, but they don't happen um, often enough. And so I'm hoping that if there is time for a Q&A period that I can learn a little bit more about the, and we can talk together about the degree to which you may be, there may be somebody responsible for initiating and ensuring that family meetings take place, that they cut across the specialists who are involved in the care of that patient, not just happening by one specialist, but actually bring in all the, all the actors, and whether or not the code that CMS is providing is really been a, it hasn't been helpful, is it, a, is it a spur for these conversations to occur? The only point I want to make now is, though, that despite our privileging of autonomy and our focus on the right of patients to self-determination, I, I think it's fair to say that those rights have not been fully effectuated in practice for the, some of the reasons that I've just given with some of those examples. But then we have the paradox that we've also overlearned and overapplied the concept of autonomy. Um, and I actually think it's only fair for me to say that uh, maybe clinicians have overlearned it, but pro possibly bioethics has overtaught it. Rather than treating autonomy as an important principle, too often we're treating it as the only principle um, or the major principle. And when that happens, my view is that you, clinicians, diminish your professional integrity and your you often turn yourselves into technicians just asking patients what they want rather than acting as professional guides offering wisdom and experience to help families make these decisions. In other words, too often autonomy has been misunderstood and overlearned, and that has caused clini clini clinicians to sometimes refrain from offering professional judgments. Maybe that doesn't happen here. I don't know, but I do know that it happens in many, many places around the country where there seems to be uh, just ask the patient what they want, but don't feel that you have the right to give an opinion about that. Um, this frequently happens, in my experience with uh, working in many health systems around the country, this often happens in regard to decisions about do not resuscitate orders. Most often it's the most junior person on the team who is sent to go get the DNR order. In this article, um, your own Craig Blinderman, who heads up the palliative care service here, um, and, uh, and Eric Krakauer, a physician at MGH, and I wrote this piece, I guess it came out in, I'm not even sure, 2012. And um, we wanted to bring attention to how poorly the DNR order is currently broached with most patients and how easy it is for patients to feel that if their doctor is bringing it up, then it must be offering some benefit. Why else would my doctor even ask me? So we offer in this piece, which was published in JAMA, we offer a new approach. Um, and in cases where CPR is extremely unlikely to offer any meaningful benefit, we discourage the offering of CPR. We don't think it should be an even-handed question, do you want us to or not want us to. We think it is appropriate for the for professionals to tilt that and explain a little bit about why it might not, why it is not, why it is that they are not going to offer it. But we want it to be frankly disclosed that they're not offering it. So that's how we hit that sweet spot between disclosure and professional judgment. And now this is indeed the policy at Massachusetts General Hospital and um, an MGH team led by um, Ellen Robinson, a nurse who chairs their ethics committee have written extensively about how a policy very similar to what Craig and I called for um, is in place there. And they have found that most families actually accept a physician's recommendation against CPR and they agree to the DNR order. However, of course, the hard cases are those in which the physician feels it's wrong to impose CPR because it's going to be harmful and not do any, bring any benefit, and the families who um, insist on that. So those are the tough cases. So what should an institution do when they're faced with that very tough case? Well, Ellen Robinson at MGH um, actually studied 
the, how families reacted to their new policy of not offering it. And they published many papers, but this one is interesting. Came out in the Hastings Center report. It's interesting because they found that most families accept it, but there's a hard core of families who refuse. And they wanted to study those families. And they asked themselves the normative question of how should they respond when families really do persist and insist upon something that is actually against the professional integrity of the clinician or the clinician feels it's against their integrity. And so they described what they did here. And basically, the institution backs up the clinicians at MGH. And um, in effect, MGH limits the authority of surrogates when they believe it's not in the patient's best interest to do as the surrogate is asking. So the Hastings Center report published this. And then um, our editor-in-chief, Greg Kamenick, commissioned two commentaries on this policy. I wrote one of them. And I basically supported the idea that surrogate authority could be limited if it is harming, if their decisions are harming the patient's best interest. And my dear friend and colleague um, at, at Montefiore, Tia Powell, disagreed with me and disagreed with um, Ellen Robinson's piece and said, no, we have to go with surrogates. So I just bring this to your attention because I think it's a really interesting debate. And it shows that um, this, ro this the, 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 the way in which we have thought about autonomy needs some scrutiny. OK. Um, and, and I think it's an example of the overgeneralization of the principle of autonomy, uh, of our overlearning it, because we're allowing decisions that could harm patients. We're, we're letting beneficence and non-maleficence take a lower, lower um, value than autonomy. And I want to be really clear. Please don't misunderstand. I think we should be proud in the United States of how much authority we give to patients and families. I work in many places around the world, and uh, medicine is still deeply paternalistic to the point of infringing on human rights. So I think we should be proud of the focus on self-determination. But we should also be honest. Um, you know, there are problems associated with it, and that's what I'm trying to do this afternoon, just lift up a little, a little bit of the corner of what some of those problems might be. So I've raised two of them. Here's the third concern that the focus on rights, while important, could distract us from actually meeting people's needs. And here I want to give you um, some, some examples. Um, focusing primarily, I think I have a slide about this. Yes, it's basically saying the same thing in another way, that autonomy alone can't generate the care system that people desire. Focusing primarily on individual decision making about medical interventions in the hospital, which is where bioethics has traditionally focused itself on whether to use or forego a particular life sustaining technology, rather than building a system of care that attends to the needs of patients and families. We are, it's great. We use the first 30 years of our quandary to focus on rights and to say, you know, we believe in patient self-determination and to secure those rights, that's great. But that focus of the rights you have about a specific treatment at the bedside, it has very little to do with now the obligations I think a just society has to designing communities <clears throat> that are going to meet the needs of our aging population. In 2013, the Hastings Center came out with a fully revised and updated edition of its landmark 1987 guidelines. And it called for a systems approach to improving end-of-life care. <coughs> and in 2015, the Institute of Medicine did something similar. And again, both reports um, took a systems approach. They were broadening out ethics, an ethics framework, from one that focuses solely on patient decision-making at the bedside and patient self-determination to a more relational ethics. We've had a very th thin notion of autonomy that has falsely conceived of human beings as solos, you know, that we are somehow um, complete in and of ourselves. And that, that's caused us to have this overemphasis on autonomy. But we're not just single individuals on our own. We, <clears throat> excuse me, we need to broaden our ethics thinking to include a more relational framework that emphasizes the degree to which persons are embedded in families and communities, 
and that we're all dependent on a web of interrelationships. And just having the right to say yes or no to a treatment is not the strongest moral obligation. We also have to build a relational ethic that would continue to protect patients' rights to choose their medical treatments, but would also offer a much richer conception of autonomy, which recognizes that frail and dying patients also need care, love, and attentiveness, and their caregivers need respect, support, and respite. So a relational ethics framework makes commitments to family caregivers as well as to patients and families, and it would aim to develop home and community-based care that supports the family and the patient's social and environmental and everyday logistical needs and their ability to su support their activities of daily living. Um, so what we've been calling care near the end of life actually has been a pretty narrow definition. And what we need to do, I think, is create a continuum of care that looks not only at how we die, but also at how we live. And I want to, for the last part of my remarks, I want to use another case. I told you about Brian, where the case was unclear about whether to go to dialysis or not. This is a case that's, that illustrates the importance of thinking about um, autonomy in a much richer way and that has to do, that has obligations for us to think outside of the, the healthcare system. This is Joseph Andre and his daughter Maureen. Nina, the journalist Nina Bernstein wrote about them on the pages of the New York Times in 2014. When this picture was taken, he was 91 years old, he was a widower. He had multiple chronic condi conditions and functional dependency that required help with activities of daily living. However, he had no cognitive decline. He was very with it. And he wanted to be at home. He loved books. He loved the music on his CDs. And he wanted to be there. His daughter was a school teacher. She had to work, but she was a very big part of his care. She came to his home every day after school and um, helped make sure that he could get ready for bed and get his supper. And this worked for a really long time, and it also worked because New York State has very generous um, Medicaid benefits. And so the combination of his willing daughter being nearby and the Medicaid aid really enabled him to stay at home for a long time. But then the article shows that this only lasted for a while. The last two years of his life, he had unnecessary revolving door stays at nursing homes, emergency room visits, hospital admissions, all this churning and the change of care setting that I talked about earlier. All he really needed was simple logistical support at home. But instead, he was admitted to nursing homes that were terribly understaffed. He developed pressure sores and a systemic infection. He was deeply miserable most of the time, and with no cognitive impairment, he knew that he was miserable, and he knew that he had been in effect, abandoned, even though he had a loving, committed daughter. Think about the insanity of this. Over the last two years of his life, Medicare paid $682 per day when health, home health services would have cost a tiny fraction of that. Ultimately, over the two years, the last two years of his life, his care cost $1 million. And that $1 million was spent on many health problems that arose because of the poor care in the nursing home. He knew he was dying. He was not demanding medical treatment of any kind. His daughter was his health care agent. And they had clear, clear goals for his care, which were to keep him comfortable at home. In other words, they had really done their part as far as advanced care planning goes. They had done their part. But this is a this is a problem that cannot be solved family by family. To improve the lives of people like Mr. Andre and their caregivers, especially those with limited financial resources, we need to help policymakers and the public understand population aging as an issue of shared concern rather than a problem each family has to struggle with on its own. So what can we do? For one thing, for our part at the Hastings Center, we've convened an interdisciplinary group that represents a lot of different, uh, crosses a lot of different um, boundaries and represents a lot of areas of expertise that you wouldn't ordinarily think about when you're talking about end of life care. So we've included urban planners, um, experts in housing and transportation, 
And we've asked this wide-ranging set of um, experts to consider what sorts of changes should be envisioned um, beyond the context of the delivery of medical care. How might local housing be redesigned? How might transportation be redesigned? How can we reduce social isos isolation? And across all these themes, I guess you could sum up the questions that we're looking at. Oh, I think there's a slide missing. Oh, well, that's okay. The questions are, what makes a good life in late life? And what does a just society owe to its older members? These ideas, the way we answer those two questions, what makes a good life in late life, and what does a just society owe to its members, all those are going to be coming out in September, October issue of the Hastings Center Report as an essay set. And um, it will be open access. So the slide that's missing tells you how you can be sure to get your copy. But I'll let, I'll let the people who here know how to do that. So in closing, I want to try to summarize with five recommendations. And I'm looking both at questions around how medical care itself inside a health system like this might change and also how we think about its relationship to the broader community. So I'm making comments that are relevant to both. Fortunately, there are really excellent models. The PACE program <clears throat> is very good. It's been proven to ensure both medical access to the highest level of, of, of technology, but also supports to help people stay in their home. And it's been very, very well researched. It's, um, let's see, a whole bunch of my slides are missing. Oh, great. All the recommendations are missing, so you have to listen really carefully. Okay, that's too bad. I don't know how that happened. Wow. Okay, so I'll try to make it really clear. New forms of support and care coordination. And, I, and what you, what's missing are a lot of models out there. There's um, the PACE model. There's a model from Joanne Lynn called Medicaring Communities. And there's a model that Karen Davis, who is the former president of the Commonwealth Fund, has put out called Medicare Help at Home. We know that Medicare pays for all these life-sustaining technologies, for all the high-tech solutions, but it doesn't pay anything for high-touch solutions. And so Karen Davis and her colleagues have called for a new benefit. Because right now, all the financial incentives are totally backwards. So reading, I'm sorry the citation's not there, reading their, their, both Joanne Lynn and Karen Davis's proposals are meant to try to change those financial incentives. Uh, <clears throat> the Aspen Institute, that's the next slide, I hope you're enjoying it, <clears throat> recently released a report that calls on Medicare to, re <clears throat> to reimburse for a team approach that will provide social supports and coordination through a team. And they're hoping to promote teamness through the benefit only being eligible if the health system creates that team. Um, and unlike, but it would be reimbursed for, ver for lots of logistical support, activities of daily living and all of that. And it would not require, like the Medicare hospice, unlike the Medicare hospice benefit, it would not require a six-month life expectancy. Now, many experts believe that these proposals would be cost-neutral because existing research shows, well, just what I showed you with Mr. Andre. Um, <clears throat> there's an opportunity to shift, not to spend more, but to shift what we spend money on without necessarily requiring additional funds. Now, given, the, and the Aspen report is calling on reform at the national level, payment, re Medicare payment reform at the national level. Given today's political climate, I think it's extraordinarily unlikely that we are going to get relief at the national level. But I think there's a silver lining to that. There's actually an opportunity for health systems to make a lot of progress on their own. Um, capitated spending and bundling that have occurred with the growth of accountable care organizations means that we could change things at the system level even as the federal level is stalled. Not saying it wouldn't be great to get the, the Medicare changes, but let's be real, they're not going to happen right now. But there's a lot that leadership at the system level could actually do, and many healthcare organizations are recognizing that. I realize that maybe that's naive because so many of our current health delivery organizations are reliant upon current revenue models, and systems might be more likely <clears throat> to build lucrative specialty services than to build the social supports and care coordination that I'm describing. But I'd like to hope that um, there is the leadership to recognize the, the wisdom of moving, to continue the move away from fee-for-service toward bundling, toward capitation, that would allow these kinds of experiments that are going on in a number of places and that we could supercharge now that we can't do anything at the federal level. 
Um, let's see, my next, yeah, I'm so sorry you can't see these. So supportive care and coordination was one. Two was payment reform. That's what I've just been talking about. Three is identifying the right target population. It might seem easier than it really is to know who should get these services. And there again, there's been research on that. Um, Kelly and colleagues have estimated that there are 8 million patients. That, they rep that represents 2.5% of our population. Um, and they're able to sort of to, to describe who they are so that you could find indicators in your own health systems to identify who those people are and offer them the consults and offer them um, a, a new pathway that t veers away from the defaults we've had in the system. Um, once we prospectively identify this group, we need to have reliable measures of effectiveness of outcomes that work. That was my fourth bullet that you're not seeing. So reliable metrics. The National um, Commission for Quality Assurance, NCQA, is working on those right now. So any of you that are interested in this kind of system redesign may want to check out what NCQA is doing to um, see how you could start to measure your innovative interventions. And then um, lastly, <clears throat> we need to expand specialty palliative care, and we need to build primary palliative care. Um, given that the Michelle Lecture honors residents and early career clinicians, I think it's fitting that my final recommendation focus on training, on building both specialty and primary palliative care through training. Only about 20% of residents nationwide plan to go into primary care, only 1% plan to go into geriatrics or palliative medicine. Today, there are 5,500 board-certified palliative care specialists in the country, and the estimates are that we need to tr at least triple that number to 15 or 18,000 if we're going to be able to provide care to the baby boomers. Um, similarly, we need to ensure that all clinicians, not just board-certified specialists, have basic literacy in palliative medicine. And, um, our, the part we've tried to play in this at the Hastings Center is we developed a partnership with the Society for Hospital Medicine. I hope this slide is here. Oh, darn it. Oh, you know what? I see what happened. Look, I, okay, I get it. <laughs> that's my mistake. Um, that's everything I just told you. That earlier slide is also my last slide, and that's why I thought things were missing. Okay. So, our partnership with the Society for Hospital Medicine, they've never really been involved or been asked to, to be involved in advanced care planning. Um, th we reached out to their leadership, and together we developed a new pathway. You don't, I don't expect you to read this. I just want you to know it exists. You can go to the Society of Hospital Medicine website, and it is, it, this was two years, and it took two years to work together to break the defaults and create a new pathway that hospitalists are now being encouraged to apply to ensure that advanced care planning happens. And you can re get all the resources that we developed on their website. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, over the last 35 years, from a time when our society didn't know whether withdrawing a ventilator would be killing someone, the Karen Ann, the, 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 the Karen Ann Quinlan kind of question, um, the United, from that time, the United States has put in place a very robust ethical and legal framework for making bedside treatment decisions for patients near the end of life. It emphasizes autonomy in vitally important ways, but now we need to expand it. Um, we need to figure out how it can also include attention to meeting people's needs. We need to redesign our systems of health care delivery. It's one of our most important challenges. Public it's, but it's really difficult. Public trust will need to be nurtured so that there can be mature conversations about options. New pathways of care will have to disrupt the defaults and will need, at the same time, changes in the community outside of the healthcare system for new forms of housing and transportation and help with activities of daily living for the millions of Americans that are going to enter frailty and, and, and dementia. And on top of it all, these new arrangements are going to be disruptive. There will be both financial winners and losers. We are all, you know, everyone is making money on a system that isn't really benefiting us. But to disrupt that system, some will win and some will lose. So we need 
moral courage. We need morally courageous hospital trustees. I don't know if there are any here. I hope there are. Healthcare executives, payers need to think about this more carefully, policymakers, clinicians, community leaders, and families willing to build new systems of medical care and social support in the community. I brought you a story about Brian, not a story, but a you know, a recollection of, of a young man who was very distressed. I think if we think about Brian, I brought you a story about Mr. Andre, and if we keep them in mind, hopefully we will find the courage and the commitment to disrupt our own uh, ways of doing things. I know it's going to be really difficult, so I want to end with the wise words of a great American philosopher, Gary Larson. Okay, Mr. Dittman, remember, this brain is only a temporary one, so don't think too hard with it. Okay, thanks for your attention. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's the kind of thing that PACE or the Medicare communities that Joanne Lynn is advocating or the benefit that Karen Davis is urging us, ur urging Medicare to provide would enable to happen. But it, this can happen well or it can happen terribly. I mean, it, it can be a dump them back at home and put all this burden on self-care in a situation where nobody has the human beings there to, to actually learn and help with it. Or it could be a very good thing if we built it, if we had paid caregivers or, or respite or all the things that would, you would need for the human surround. So I just would, I think it's promising, but we should be, we should hold its feet to the fire to make sure that all that context gets attended to. Rita. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Which includes emotion and, and, and insight and fellow feeling and things that, that we, in effect, train out of what's called the long run. So, so um, thank you for the subversive. Thank you for calling it subversive. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, yes. So I do think New York is an outlier. I think it's more difficult here. I mean, even if you just look at our brain death stipulation that there's religious exemptions for brain death, that's something New York probably should be proud about, that, there's so, that, we're, that we value the diversity of, of, this, of this population. Um, but it is different, and it probably is easier in Massachusetts. But I don't want to leave it at that. I mean, the MGH research shows that when physicians really do use their 
experience and judgment and are willing to offer judgments and to offer recommendations, most families do go along. So yeah, if you've got this hard case where the family won't go along, you're gonna have a tougher time. And maybe that's a good thing because New York has decided you should have a harder time. Okay, I'm okay with that. But I think that there's also some responsibility on the part of clinicians and systems to do what Rita just said, to learn how to hold these conversations in a way that families will be able to understand. Families don't wanna torture their loved ones. But if they haven't been helped to understand the real pros and cons, then they're not going to, then they're not going, they're going to push in every way they know. And if that's what they know, that's what they're going to push with. Um, their research showed that when it was properly explained, most families did go along. And I don't think the families are different in New York and Massachusetts. Okay, thank and also you. I was going to say when the legal system understands the But it's very, very rare that it actually goes to the legal system. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. And now we come to the uh, awards uh, portion of the program. Um, it was decided from the initiation of this House staff award that the awardee would be selected by the medical house staff rather than by the faculty. Accordingly, ballots were sent out in April asking them to vote for a PGY3 resident who best exemplifies Joseph Michelle's qualities of kindness, empathy, and integrity. Somebody who is a staunch advocate for his or her patients. As far as we could tell, there was no Russian interference in the voting. <laughs> I read the comments on all of the ballots and can honestly say that many of the House staff members are deserving of such an award. So before announcing the winner, I would like to just acknowledge the runner-up, Dr. Catherine Dubowski, who I understand <laughs> we understand is on elective in Africa now. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, the award this year goes to Dr. Sarah Cromer. Comments from her house staff colleagues mentioned that her humanity and compassion are deep, consistent, and unfailing, and about how caring she is towards patients and fellow residents. Sarah, can you please come up to the podium? This is the award plaque. And it says the Dr. Joseph and Michelle House Staff Award presented to Sarah Jane Cromer, MD, whose qualities as a skilled physician and an empathetic, compassionate human being exemplify the highest standards of medical care. On behalf of Dr. Donald L. Landry, Dr. Mark Stupler, and Dr. Kenneth Prager. Congratulations. Um, this is also accompanied by a stipend, which we will take care of afterwards. So, Sarah, if you have the podium, if you want to say a few words. Uh, just briefly, I wanted to say um, thank you, Dr. Stupler. Thank you to the Michelle family, of course. Um, but as you mentioned, uh, when I learned that I received this award, I couldn't help but think of the many, many people in my class who are equally, if not more, deserving from my experience. And while on, you know, we all like to think that our kindness comes from within, I've found in residency that a lot of my inspiration to kindness has come from without. When I see uh, one of my colleagues or one of my pod mates stay late to speak to a family member who couldn't come during business hours or put aside their own needs and their own enjoyment in order to spend time with a patient who's lonely, those are the things that have really inspired me to um, give of myself as well and to try and emulate my peers who I respect so much. Um, and so on that note, I would like to especially thank the Michelle family for creating this award because it really does um, both honor Joseph and everything that he stood for, but also lead us and remind us to honor and recognize people who are really standing out and making a difference in this residency. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> That concludes the program for today. Sure.
Oh, yeah. Jack, I have another one. I think, I think the speaker may have picked it up with her papers. 